Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the About Podcast. Weekly episode where you give a taste of music, TV, music, and video games. Not necessarily in that order, but we're going to be doing a little bit something different today because one, it's just me, and two, there's a lot to talk about over the past week. Um, not just in terms of news, but mainly in terms of thoughts. So I figured we're going to try something different, split it up, since I've been consuming a lot of media, to say, to the uh, just thoughts portion today. And then we'll see if this works well with having a separate thoughts video and a separate, uh, you know, news video. But we'll get to that when we get there. So let's start right at the top here, as we always do, with the music section. And there was no bigger album this week than Taylor Swift. But I didn't listen to Taylor Swift at first. I mean, yes, I did listen to it. But before we get there, I got to talk about a different album that I talked to, that I um, watched, listened to. And that is the Linkin Park album. Uh, this is a new album called Paper Cuts. This album is specifically the eh, greatest hits album. And I put that in quotes because there's a lot of stuff that I think wouldn't be considered greatest hits. And also there's missing greatest hits. Uh, especially if you're going to pick at least one from every album. There is one album missing, Living Things, or sorry, Hunting Party. But I think that's on purpose. Uh, but other than that, this is mainly a compilation of collections of their singles hits. From 2000, when they began, all the way to 2017. Actually, not even 2017, it's 2024, because on it is three, well, it's two new songs, and one kind of lost in the vault track. Uh, that one being Wordy, which was released way back, in a part of, in between uh, Reanimation and their initial debut album. of uh, um, Not hybrid things, not living things. Oh, come on. Why, why can't I th I think of it? Uh, whatever. But it's new. It's it's new in that it gets finally gets an official release and not a um, underground release. Uh, in addition to that, you also get the two new songs, one being Lost and one being Friendly Fire, getting the official release on streaming. So now that they get part of the album, they get part of tracking, and they get part of, hey, you know, just overall making money for the team. Uh, the team being over there at Lincoln Park. Um, it's a compilation album. It is the Greatest Hits album. Technically, in this kind of day and age, do we need Greatest Hits album when you can just create your own um, your own specific Greatest Hits album for an artist? Because I know that's what I've been doing, especially with Lincoln Park and a bunch of other artists uh, that I have followed in the past that, hey, this is the Greatest Hits for me but for them like this is their greatest hits in terms of a single compilation and it's out it's there i've been listening to it it's nice to have it all in one go instead of just trying to pick and choose or put it on a, a spotify um a spotify kind of shuffle or apple shuffle uh instead it's just all there um which is you know it's nice to have uh there is a vinyl release for it so it's good to have it just in a vinyl release form you know Assuming you're a big Lincoln Park fan like I am. But let's start beating around the bush because you're here for one thing and one thing only, as we all are, and that is Taylor Swift. Her new album, The Di uh, the Torture Poets Department, is out. It's breaking Spotify records which, and it's breaking Spotify numbers because... It's not just a regular album. It is a goddamn double album. And I do say goddamn with all the vitriol in it because you gotta listen to all two hours of this thing. Is it worth it? No. But then again, I'm kind of not the person, headspace, mindspace that this is kind of directed at. Um, the Tortured Poets Department is kind of more geared for people who had relationships in their 20s, thought it was going to be the one, ended up breaking off, uh, and now you're kind of 
left to pick up the pieces. And that's more or less what this album is. Uh, it will feel kind of cathartic for people who are in the Taylor Swift realm, in their knowledge of like all her day-to-day -day activities, her weekly activities. Um, but it's not necessarily a pop album. I think it's more in line with like when Folklore and Evermore came out, that it's more of a personal actually it's even more of them because personal because folklore and Evermore even had like stories and tales in within it and kind of like a through thought line. Whereas this feels more like an inter like a diary reading almost. That you're reading uh Taylor's thoughts on the situations, you're reading her individual um take. Sometimes it's chaotic, sometimes it's nervous, sometimes it's breakdown. Uh, a lot of, I would say, Mirrorball references, even though Mirrorball is more of a pop song now compared to all of this, where it feels like she's spinning out of control or just wants to somehow, like, scream into the void. Um, but yet she keeps chugging along and, as a result, has written 31 songs. There's two albums. There's a 15, ver is it 15 and, uh, original album and then a 16 song album. Uh, titled the anthology so combined it's 31 songs um yeah because five plus six plus one plus one is 13 and that's the inside taylor swift knowledge of, of how you get to number 13 her lucky number uh i from what i've read online and i don't feel this way but a lot of people seem to is that it's a very 30 something album of people who have listened to Taylor Swift her entire career um, from Fearless. Yes, I know she had Taylor Swift like debut album, but we know she broke out with Fearless and those who followed her through her albums till now, it feels like an album made for them and not really made for general uh, pop radio. And coming off of Midnight's, which did win Album of the Year, it is, Album Midnight's does feel more like a pop record than this does. This feels more string of thought. This feels more, like I said, very personal um, in her consciousness, uh, stream of consciousness in writing this down. At points in this, I felt like, should I be listening to this? This doesn't hit me as well. But that being said, I had the same kind of thought process when I listened to John Party's Heartache Medication, which does cover kind of the same topics of, hey, maybe like it does suck. I mean, not maybe it does suck to break up. It does suck to um, spend what is essentially most of your adult life, your 20s or six years or however long in a relationship only for it to just end and then feel like, well, where do I go now? What's the next step? Like, I thought that was the one. I thought I had it all planned out. And now I have to pick myself up. I have to pick up the pieces. I have to dust myself off. And I have to continue going. And that she was doing this all while during uh, the Eras tour, while performing on a weekend and almost nightly basis um, that... Even one of the lines in in the album, she says that, uh, I think it's the heartbreak song, where, yeah, she can do it with a heartbreak, but she's still going to hit her mark. She's still going to go out, still shining. People, she's going to be, essentially, I think she calls herself a functioning alcoholic in that she was definitely spiraling, but she still had to put on a show for everyone. She can't stop the tour because she's having a eh, midlife crisis a functional a uh, relationship crisis a um a an, an unknown in her life and to continue to go out to perform for her fans um it makes even looking at the uh the heiress tour documentary documentary concert video however you want to say it um it's kind of a new light that hey she i mean oh god See, this is where the Taylor Swift like lore and like knowledge plays into where was she dating Travis Kelsey at the time? And I don't think it was confirmed. They may have been, but I don't think it was confirmed. 
because the show was filmed in SoFi, which was on the in mid August, and she didn't show up to the first Chiefs game until mid September, mid October after the season had already started. So unsure if they were dating by then, if they were talking by then, but it was an interesting kind of take in when if you go and look back on that that hey maybe she was still going through tough times um i'm not the one to speak on taylor swift lore for that go to matt um uh, he's been in the uh taylor sphere i guess you could say uh longer than i have um uh, he's the one who's well got me to uh, forcibly listen to or Trying to remember when we did our Taylor tourney last year, was that I mean, we did it because the air is to her, but was that because Matt wanted to do it or because I wanted to do it, or was it just his way of getting me to listen to all the Taylor Swift stuff? Or just no, you're like, okay, I'll just I'll, I'll guess I'll sit at discography if I want to go to the concert and I know most of the songs, but I want to know all the songs. Uh, so kind of a bit of back and forth there because I am admittedly late to the Taylor Swift party and it is more or less kind of hindering my experience uh of enjoying uh the tortured poets department i like what it's doing i think this is cathartic for a lot of people i think i've seen online that a lot of people do resonate with this i've also seen a lot of critics both super older and super younger not uh resonating with it uh feeling like it misses the mark because it's not like any album that she's put out before. I think that she's kind of hit her stride where she, because of streaming, and this is strictly because of streaming, that she no longer has to edit herself. Well, it's actually a combination because of how she was treated and dealt with, um, not dealt with, that's a poor term, how she was treated and edited and kind of reined in while she was at Big Machine Records, and then breaking away from that and going into Universal Music Group, where she is now, and them more or less giving her a carte blanche of, you put out music, and or you create music, and we'll release it. And that's kind of the relationship they have right now, where, hey, she created an album during the pandemic, and then she created another album during the pandemic. Technically, you could kind of say that Folklore and Evermore were double albums, because they were like, I don't know, it's four months apart, separate. Um, but then even then, she released Midnight's like a year later, and that, or a year or two later, and even that one uh, had a 3 a.m. edition of a bunch of bonus tracks. And here she is dropping the double album with the anthology a part of it. Um, and I think that it's more or less just the impact of streaming and not being beholden to fit 12, 13 songs on a record. She no longer, and we've seen this with Drake too and a bunch of other um, more uh, other artists, not going to say his name, who have done double albums where we've gotten to this point, especially in streaming, where you don't need to edit yourself to just 12, 13 songs. You don't need to be contained to what are the songs that fit within the theme that I'm trying to say? What are the songs that flow together in a, an album that she's hit her stride where she can create 31 songs, put them all out there, and let the fans and the critics decide which ones hit, which ones work for them, which ones deserve the play. That, in a way, she's taken the guesswork of trying to create hits out of her hands, out of her management's hands, and put it to the fans. That being said, yes, there's still some editing and still some uh, manipulation of the tracks as to which songs go first, which songs go second, putting them in a certain order, but you no longer have to limit the number in that order. That's what I'm trying to get at, is that when you put out a double album and 31 songs, that's you writing, recording, editing, producing 31 different tracks. As she says in um, Midnight's album, 
the girl doesn't stop. She just keeps going. And this is just an, another conscious string of it that she just keeps putting out songs. Um, I should probably go back to reel it in a bit and just go to like my thoughts on the uh, Tortured Poets department and you know talk about the actual songs because like i said there's a lot on here that deals with breakup deals with uh the what if scenarios deals with like the spiral the i'm just going to live my life um the i want to celebrate every day like it's my birthday because i can um the uh the overall like wonderment of what happens now what is the next steps there is no roadmap for this and that she is our or at least my age 30 mid 30s and doesn't have it all figured out and basically saying that that's okay you don't need to have it figured out most people don't have it figured out that you're the plan that you thought you had you can blow it up you can start over and it can be okay it can be okay to do that and i think a lot of people kind of need to hear that that you can break off those previous relationships that you had you can start fresh start new start start in a different scenario that you're not beholden to your past mistakes you're not beholden to others past mistakes you're not beholden to anything that not beholden to anything just because it's been your way of doing it that you can start new you can just essentially go off the deep end and make your way to the bottom in order to come all the way up a fresh person it's a lot there's a lot in this album i do think that everyone should listen to it um especially those who have gone through deep long-term relationship heartbreak and ending um i think down the line this is an album that's going to grow on people not necessarily because it's gonna improve with time in terms of its message but i think because the message is a bit timeless and that anyone coming to this at any point in their life wherever they feel that heartbreak or heartache or just that chaos of not knowing what what where to go or what to do that at some point everyone will hit that in their life and they can come to this album as a way of feeling that catharsis, as a way of getting that the, uh, those emotions that you have in your head or in your heart out, that you can listen to it and be like, this is exactly how I'm feeling. This is exactly what I'm thinking, that someone finally put it into words and that I might be able to say it, but I can point to this album or these songs and be like, this is how I'm feeling. This is what's um, what's going on in my head. And... I'm sure Matt will say more on it, but for now, I mean, that's more or less what I have to kind of say on it. It's a good album, um, and everyone should probably listen to it. Although, going to the streaming numbers, chances are you will have listened to it. And now, with that kind of ramble out of the way, I don't have any other music news or thoughts so let's move on into video games where i was able to play the newest ist newest dlc it's final fantasy it's not seven it's not rebirth they're going back again to final fantasy 16 a dlc the rising tide uh this is the single episode dlc this is separate um, from the fallen echoes and continues the story of clive but before he goes and battles the uh final boss ultima uh yeah this is a weird um kind of episode to have because most people will have beaten the game this episode takes place after you've beaten the game. But to unlock the episode, you have to complete pretty much every other main story and side quest because it's right at the very end. 
and where this lands is kind of middling for me because it does provide a little a bit more um context in the overall mythos of final this final fantasy version but i'm not sure if it adds a lot of uh stakes to it like it was missing it does feel like dlc it does feel like add-on because the rising tide um place itself is separate from the mainland of uh Wailud and the continent that you're on so because it's on a separate island because it's a separate place and the I think that's the one thing that's missing it for it for me is that in the base game for Final Fantasy 16, every single character you meet is interacting with other characters that you meet. Every single um, icon that you meet and every single dominant that you meet is interacting with one of the other icons or dominants. Whereas when the Rising Tide comes in, because it's been an isolated feature, because it's been an isolated city, they've never had any contact with any of the other icons or dominants or people, characters that you interact with. So it does feel very kind of standoffish, very side questy, very um, kind of island out in the distance. Um, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, you have the continent of Africa and then over there is Madagascar. Yes, technically it's a part of the continent of Africa, but we always see it as its own separate thing because it's off to the side. Same thing with, like, I guess the U.S. and Hawaii. Like, it's there, it's part of the U.S., but it's so far out of the way that you literally have to take a, a, a boat or a plane to it uh, to get to it to um, consider it a part of the the U.S. Uh, that it does feel like side content and additional content, especially because it is way out there and not... Uh, directly connected uh so a lot of what the story is about is finding the missing icon and dominant the dormant one the one that went missing for 80 to 100 years almost and figuring out why this happened to this city why this happened to these these people that they kind of disappear on the map that they've become uh back to they've um reverted or not reverted They've been converted to kind of a myth and legend of, well, at one point they existed, but we don't see them anymore. And you wonder why. And this kind of explains that. Although in the actual base game, the people are not brought up, which is why it feels like a shoe and add on. Um, yes, that's kind of the point of DLC. But at the same time, if you're going to do that, at least lay the seeds within the game to say, hey, this was a part of it. Like, this was here the whole time. This was just a missing part of it. Uh, it doesn't quite feel that way. Um, it feels definitely feels like it's just added on. Um, but the one good thing that does come out of it is the new gameplay mechanic of the Leviathan uh, kind of icon that you get to play with. Uh, you get to now have a very ranged attack. You get to... Um, shoot bubbles at everyone uh throw up water spouts as well as offer a tsunami uh to both pull in and deal damage to all your enemies i think it's a nice addition to what was missing in an otherwise kind of full arsenal of a game uh that did kind of feel like a lot of it was hands-on attack and they didn't have anything of a ranged attack variety this adds to it um there were range attack, but it was really like one off shoot, 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 shoot. And this is like a full on like arsenal of barrages of ranged attacks. So that's nice to have. And you don't have to, um, especially dealing with enemies that want to either run away or fly away, that you don't have to just hack and slash your way through, that there is now an option to it. Uh, a water gun, essentially. Uh, I mean, it's like a big like claw that comes out of your arm, too, which is a nice touch. Uh, think of like crab, crab brawler. Uh, Pokemon. Uh, so that's that's nice to have. Uh, I think that's the best part of it, and you did get that kind of early. So yes, you get it early, but by the time you get to it, 
actually using it in anything outside of the DLC uh, is very uh, minimal. Because by the, like I said, by the time you get to it, you've already completed every other main quest and side quest. So the only real challenging bosses after you've defeated is the main boss himself if you want to um, complete the game that way. Uh, it does add some more challenges to the uh, to the rising uh, the monolith in your home base so you can do more challenges it unlocks an extra arena to do that and if you want to complete and get all of the uh, trophies you need to do that kind of content as well to 100% it I haven't done that yet I'm on my way to do it uh, but it does feel like a bit of a boss rush um, make sure you're dodging and parrying and stuff. I will say though that the um big dominant battle between your dominant uh if the Efreet and the Leviathan is something that is puts a little um a nice capstone at the end of the, the DLC. It's a very big boss battle. It's a very ugly boss battle. Um, definitely streamed it if you want to watch it on uh Twitch.tv backslash Media Boat. And trying to um, defeat it was quite a, a an issue with me. I think that just because it was very like pound, 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 and you gotta like defeat it right in the nick of time. Otherwise, you're just gonna get wiped away. Didn't really like that. Uh, but that was my only like main negative in the big. Otherwise, you know, show stopping fight that a uh, battle. A battle of titanic perform performances typically is. So it's there. I think it's $25 for both this one and the uh, Echoes of the Fallen. I think it does add to it, but it's not like a mandatory, oh, you got to play it because like it definitely enhances the story. I think it adds a good attack mechanic, but the actual story can be enjoyed without it. And like I said, it doesn't really add a whole lot of new context to the game or way like you see something different. Whew. That's a lot through video games, but we are not done because we have some shows to talk about, mainly two cooking shows. I'm going to start with the first one here called Wildcard Kitchen. Uh, both the shows I'm going to talk about are Food Network shows. I don't know why this is Food Network Canada. It might be. I don't think it is. Um, so, what Wildcard Kitchen is, it's a kind of, eh, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory. It's a kitchen battle a la poker. Um, there's a, a bunch of community cards that all the chefs can use. But each chef is given one wild card specific to them and their dish. Uh, what makes this kind of unique is that the chefs are literally gambling with their own money. This is what the show says. I don't know if they actually do it. Um, that they each bring in $5,000 and they gamble on how much they think they can create a dish better than their opponents. Um, now, because they're using their own money... These are not your fresh chefs, your everyday chefs. These are kind of Food Network staples. These are people that you've seen on other Food Network competition shows. Some of these are judges on other competition shows. Some of them have competed and won other shows. And some of them have written multiple uh, posts, recipes, books, cookbooks, restaurateurs, uh, related to the Food Network and their own um, food empire. Thus, why they have $5,000 of their own money to come in and bet on, or bet with. Uh, it's fun. Oh yeah, this guy's the host, by the way. Um, it's kind of a fun competition, but at the same time, it's very, I think, high-end um, competition. Whereas something like Guys, grocery games, or even uh, is 
And if I compare it to like guys go through games and then the tournament of champions, this is edging more on the side of tournament of champions, where these are very professional chefs creating very exotic specific food. Whereas guys go through games and more like chopped is very limiting of the, these uh chefs, and it's more a line of a competition of who can create the best dish with these within these circumstances. But done at a very like high end level uh competition, not stuff that I would ever like think of creating or like like it's not like oh like watch this to like gain ideas. It's more watch how out of your league you you think you are, and just like shows like how insanely masterful these chefs root truly are that uh, Food Network not only employs but also like they compete with um but that is not the um by the way you don't have to watch these on food number these are all available on uh max because that brings me to my next uh show also on food network slash max new cooking competition titled 24 in uh, there's an in in there it's uh 24 in 24 uh, last chef standing. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, last chef standing. Uh, this is a twenty-four hour cooking competition, where each where it's broken up into six different unique blocks. So every four hours, they're changing up the technique, and one by one, you have to cook twenty-four different gauntlets. Not necessarily dishes or bites, but different gauntlet challenges in a 24-hour period. So that means the competition doesn't stop, the clock doesn't stop, and you're constantly racing against it. Uh, the first episode is available right now on Max. It is a speed competition, um, both in terms of prep, but then also in terms of battle, because right off the bat, you're not going to have 24 chefs always competing and then 20, 20 blah, 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 trickle it down. Right off the bat, just axe half the, the field. So, right off the bat, you're not, even though you're dealing with 24 chefs, you're not really by the first episode as they get immediately sliced down to 12 chefs in a, a tasting battle. But the remaining 12 chefs with the remaining 20 hours are competing against each other creating unique dishes based on the different uh, skill set that a chef should have. Um, and they'll be tested on the variety of different skill sets. Um, the first one is on uh, speed, as I mentioned. There's going to be stuff on plating, on design, on uh, creativity as the competition goes on. But because it is a 24-hour competition, they don't sleep. Uh, they barely get any rest. It's just one right after the other. They create the food. They get judged. You can watch the clock on the back as it ticks away. There's about a 20-minute respite between 20 to 30 minutes between the judge coming in and tasting the food, declaring a winner, and moving on to the next one uh, before you know they have to move right into the next competition. And that's one thing I like about this is that there is no stop. It's just all go, all gas, no breaks. There is no stopping of the competition. They, the clock is always running until it hits 24 hours. At that time, uh, the winner will receive $50,000. Yeah, for for a 24-hour food competition, you only win $50,000. Uh, now, that's not all you can win. There, you can win additional money uh 2500 per competition that the best tasting dish gets an additional $2500 so in theory i think if i'm doing my math ahead correctly there's up to a total of $100,000 but not everyone is going to be gaining not one person will win the entire $100,000 it's 50,000 to one person and then split up 2500 to other people or whoever wins of the remaining 12 I mean, I like it because it's fast paced. I like it because it's um, it's a 
different style of cooking competition, um, unlike other shows on Food Network. Uh, this is a constantly running show. Although shows not constantly running, the timer is constantly running, so they're constantly cooking, and it's going to be fun to see by the end. Uh, the chef who has the fortitude to cook in the kitchen for twenty four hours. Uh, that's all I've been watching. Um, just of note, Shogun did end, but we'll talk about that ending a bit later. Um, and I have not watched Fallout. I have no interest in watching the Fallout show. I'm not interested in playing it, even though everyone's been jumping back into the Fallout universe following the show. Uh, I just have no interest in playing it, no interest in watching it. I mean, I think I will watch it, but based off the thoughts that Matt gave, I just have no interest in um, following in that. Because uh, they give me heal and watch the first episode. I might watch the first episode, but there's no guarantee I'm going to get to it. It's just one of the things where it just doesn't interest me. But that does bring me to the movie section as we kind of end here in a bit and i watched a movie um not a new movie it was a winner at the academy awards last month um two months last month that was a month ago um for best international film the zone of interest do uh this is a this one not just best international film but also one best sound it's a film about where am i this guy uh rudolf hoss uh who was the nazi leader at auschwitz uh, and it's about him and his family who live right next door to Auschwitz. The film itself never shows a prisoner. The film itself never specifically shows any of the atrocities. It goes through great lengths to show it from the commander's side of how they thought how they acted with other uh, officers. And it goes to great lengths to display how kind of nonchalant they were about everything, about how dedicated to their work they were. But at the same time, what makes this film so important, what makes the film light one, especially for the sound design, is that even though you don't see it, it's there, it's present, uh, and you can not just see it in the number of trains that arrive via the smokestacks in the background, but also in the noises. Um, you can definitely hear it in the sound of when the guns go off. You can hear it with the screams mixed with that of children playing. Uh, you can definitely hear it um, as the guards search for people while they're out playing near a stream or river that there's definitely a lot of duality in the sound mixing um and at times in the cinematography of the of the difference between what's going on in front of you and what's goes on behind the wall that yeah you don't see the atrocities happening but you know they're there and you just see these people and this family who largely are ignoring it. It's a play on the kind of tunnel vision, and it's a play on the um, kind of what happens when you're living in your own world. That if you, that it is very easy to ignore um, atrocities that happen, even if they're just on the other side of the wall, because you don't want to acknowledge it. At one point, there's a scene where they talk about the rose, the rose vines wanting to grow and cover the wall because the wall looks disgusting and they want to beautify it. 
but it looks disgusting because of what's happening on the other side because of their own actions and it's them trying to cover it up. There's a lot of different symbolism throughout the movie just like that, which is why it's a powerful film. There's a lot of different uh, context and subtext um, within the cinematography, within the acting, within the dialogue, within, uh, like I said, the sound mostly, because you don't see it happening, but you definitely hear it happening. Um, and you can see it, um, the, how it per perpetrates through into the children as well. That you can see that the actions of the family, of the father, the mother, the aunts, the uncles, the grandmothers, the caretakers, how they are act like this is normal. And so the kids act like it's normal. That they're being influenced by the adults around them. And that if they think that this is okay of what's happening, they don't question it. They just follow it because that's what their parents see. And that plays into where we see it in today's society where it's up to the leaders of the adults in the room to set the example for the kids, to say that this is bad, that this is what is right, what is wrong. And to have that um, exude and those kind of traits passed down to other generations. It's a lot within the film, which is why it won um, for Best International Film, why it was nominated for Best Picture. It's a film that is a lot to take in because it doesn't really happen all at once. It's a film that grows, especially in the first 30 minutes where you're like, okay, I'm kind of sitting there waiting, like, where's the interest? Where's the funny? Where's the interest? Where's the interest? Uh, where's the inciting incident? What's happening? Like, what? Why am I interested in what's happening right now? And it's not because it's one thing; it's because of what's happening that you don't see, that you know is there, that you just that's not being prevalent on the screen. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a heavy-handed message movie, especially when you get to the end and it goes through actual Auschwitz and shows, like, how it is now. Um, like, that's the only time you get to see uh, inside the camp is in present day, when you get to see it as a, as a Holocaust memorial of what life was like, of all the people who were killed, all the uh, atrocities that did occur, uh, that the Holocaust is remembered, because that's one of the things is that they want to do something that gets them remembered, and they succeed, just in not the way they think it is. They, they do. Uh, so it's a heavy-handed movie, um, not necessarily a ham-fisted movie, but it's definitely one that is, um, that I think takes a toll to watch but that also comes hand in hand with kind of the subject matter uh but yeah zone of interest that's also on max and that's available to watch Ooh, i just remembered that i have one last thing to talk about and that is that um I have one last thing that I forgot to talk about in TV because it is back. It is here and alert. The Circle is back on Netflix. Uh, but this time they are introducing a AI competitor. Uh, there's one AI that has taken... Um, Basically, it's been programmed via the previous five seasons. Yes, there's been, this is the sixth incarnation of the circle. Um, there's been five previous seasons. So it's taken only the data from those seasons and is competing as an AI in this season. 
And at, at the end of the second episode, the Circle of the Sheriff says that, hey, there's a non-human competitor amongst you, which just adds into not just the current layer of the fear of AI, but also the current, fe- the all, the perpetual fear of being catfished, of someone not saying who they are. In this case, someone literally not who they are. Uh, so it's... I. It's one thing that I like about The Circle is that the producers of the show always are throwing wrinkles into the game. They are always, uh, I won't say playing by the rules, but they're making the rules as they go. They're definitely ones, this is definitely a show that, as I've said in the past, you never know what twist is going to happen, what twist is going to occur. Like, you think someone's gone, but they're not. You think someone's a person, but they're not. You think someone's doing this thing, but they're not. Uh, so it's a show. that's one thing I really like about this, the show. Yes, I do hear the argument that that can be super dumb, because if you don't know what's going to happen, then anything can happen. But that's also one thing that's super exciting about the show, is that they are literally making it up as they go, and the quick thinking of the producers well in this case this was more thought out but the um how they plan and meticulate each season to make its own unique version of itself is uh one thing that i will like about the show that i look forward to watching uh when it comes out because this thing should come out back in january but it did not uh but yeah uh with that that will do it for this episode of what uh, the media Bell podcast and more or less what i've been uh watching so thank you for tuning in uh like i said this is the thoughts version we'll try and have the actual like news version and see how this plays out uh going forward if it's something that we like, if it's something that we don't like, uh, try to try something different to where um, the actual episodes are not two hours, two and a half hours ballooned episodes, especially when the stuff that we need to talk about at length. So, so trying this experiment, trying it out, seeing if it works, and seeing if this is something that you are interested in. So, if this is something that you want, if you like this format and something you want, do more of hit us up email us at mediabeltpodcast.com on your thoughts on this format of splitting it up you can watch this on youtube media Belt podcast on spotify google play apple uh podcast amazon uh we're on twitter x uh just search media Belt cast or on facebook media Belt podcast uh twitch TV backslash media boat. We have an IMDb page. Um, just search media boat podcast. Tell us how this went. Uh, where's it? We have Discord. Um, uh, hit us up on email if you would like to be part of that Discord as well. And we are on uh, the blue sky, uh, at media boat dot bsky dot social. Um, so we'll have a regular episode of news a bit later. But for now, this has been the thought section. Okay, bye.